Now, Wadi is like a runoff. It's not a full-time river. It's at best a creek. And during the rainy seasons, it's full. It's a, it's a river. But only for about four weeks in the year is this a full river. It's usually kind of small. And it runs through basically from west to east. So the river divides the valley like this. And on the north east side, there's a mountain. And that's where the Israelites were. And on the southwest side, there's another mountain, which is where the Philistines are. So if you think about it, they're, they're looking across this valley with a small creek running through it. And that's where they're standing. Israel is off. Um, Jerusalem is off to the east. And Gath and Ekron, which are the cities of the Philistines, are on the west. So they're right between them in a the valley. All right. So that's the scene. So in this standoff, in this valley, we now have the big tall man, and the very short young man. And David, as you've heard, is walking around asking people what's going on with this giant. Why, why is this giant standing out there defying Israel and nobody's doing anything about it? And so he decides he's going to do something about it. He says, I'll take this guy out. And of course, everybody's like, no way. No way you're going to take this guy out. But David picks up five stones right next to the river, the wadi, five round stones. We find that in 1740. It says, then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the wadi and put them in his shepherd's bag in the pouch. His sling was in one hand and he drew near to the Philistine. Was David wearing any armor? Nope. Nope. And the verses right before it, Saul tries to put armor on him. And he tries to put armor on him in 38. He says, Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a bronze helmet on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. David strapped Saul's sword to his side. And he tried in vain to walk. For he was not used to them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I am not used to them. So David removed that. So what does he have? He's got regular clothing, five stones, and a sling. Before I finish up my sermon, and we talk about the, the conclusion, I'm going to need a couple volunteers. So if you are a brave individual that can handle being up high in the air, then I will need you to come up here in a minute. And I'll need one other individual to come up and help read and to um, stand to give us some perspective. So be thinking about that. If you're a brave individual, be ready to come up here and try this out with me. So David has a sling. Now a sling, we have to think of like slingshots. This is not a slingshot. Think of a jump rope. So you've got a jump rope, and imagine it's long enough to kind of wrap around yourself. Now one end of the jump rope is kind of like what a jump rope has. That's like a, a plastic or a, a wooden handle. Okay, now in the middle of the jump rope, between the two handles, there's a pouch. That's where the stone goes. So you've got the stone in the middle, up, and then on the other end, you've got like a, rather than a handle, you have sort of a, a hole or a, if you tie both ends around, you have like a little thing to grab onto. So what you would do is you would take the sling, holding both ends, you put the stone in between, and you'd sling it around like this for a while, building momentum, centrifugal. Uh, centripetal force. So the, the force acting on that stone is from the middle and it keeps it inside that pouch until you let go of that other end. What you would do is you would extend this out, you would let go of that end, and you would just let the force of it sling that stone out. Now this time there weren't bow and arrows. There were, but they weren't used very much. There were actually regiments and armies that just had slings. Now you imagine this stone is going to come out of that sling at over 100 miles an hour. I mean, this is a serious, serious weapon. A lot of people like to shoot it down, but it's a pretty big deal. And it was very accurate, much more accurate than a bow and arrow, because the arrows were too short, the bows were too short, and enough force. So that's what David has. So now, I'm going to need a volunteer. Who is brave? I'm going to have to have somebody. I can't finish this thing up without somebody. He's brave. He's brave, it's true. Anybody else want to give this a try? Okay. All right. Okay. I was kind of going to get one of these younger gentlemen, but I can try this. We'll see how this works. Okay. That means you're not a younger gentleman, Dave. Well, in this case, I'm going to try and be the 
the one with the stronger back. Okay, here's what we're going to do. Hey, Zane, can you want to try this, Zane? Zane. Oh, no. hey, Zane. All right, Zane, come on. Let's go, Zane. How tall are you, buddy? How tall? You're not sure? All right, well, it'll work, I suppose. Would you be willing to have Zane on your back? Sure. All right, so Zane, why don't you kind of get up on this thing back here for me? And then if you want to just kind of kneel in front of him, let him put his, his legs over your shoulders, if you feel comfortable with that. So put your legs over your shoulders there, Zane. Perfect. All right, now stand up for me. If you can make it down here. This will kind of get us some perspective. Zane, could you hold on? Try to sit up as best you can. Could you hold this close to the top of your head? Okay. All right. All right, so Zane and friends are about seven and a half feet tall. Just to give you perspective. You want to go this? Perfect. All right. So here we have our client. Now, if you recall, our, our basic set is about here for five feet. But if you get a sense for how tall David is not by uh, Goliath, so Goliath is also going to have a shield bearer in front of him. So there's going to be a man standing in front of him holding one of those long, tall shields. So if that's happening, if I've got my big shield and I'm standing in front of Goliath, what can you see of Goliath? <laughs> Pretty much everything about the shield is about six and a half, seven feet tall shield. You can see everything probably from his shoulders to the top of his head, right? And this is what David has to encounter. So, I'm going to, uh, very nice, good picture, I like this, very good. So this is, this is now the scene of the final end of the story. So Goliath is standing on the opposite side of the river from David, and they have a little bit of a battle of words. And here it's, we're gonna set it up for you. The Philistine comes and sees David coming, little shepherd boy with his sling and no armor on. And here's what Goliath is going to say to David. I think I have it ready to queue up. You guys got it back there. And you're going to find this in uh, 1741. Oh. The Philistine came and drew near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him. For he was only a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. And the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you covered me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by these gods. He says, one more thing. Come here, he said. I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. So that's a boasting, right? I'm a big guy. So David, David's not afraid, right? He looks up at the giant and he says, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin. But I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will hand you over to me, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. Today I will give you, I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth. And the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. And it's at this point that the Philistine comes rushing towards David, ready to kill him. And David runs towards him, sling in hand, fires, lets go. And where does that stone go, Zane? <laughs> now imagine a man who's wearing 120 pounds of armor and is 9 feet 9 inches tall. When he falls, is that going to be just like, oh? Mm -mm. No, the earth shook when this happened. You guys can, can, uh, Fall. yes, dismount, absolutely. <laughs> and so now you imagine this big man has just fallen to the earth. <laughs> and David runs over to him and proceeds to take his own sword and his head. And that's the end of that story. But I think the important bit is that last bit of words that David says. And this is how I'll conclude our thoughts today. What did David see as the problem? Was it that there was a big guy standing in defiance of Israel? Kind of. Was it because David saw that this man was saying bad stuff about the king? Kind of. What was the real issue as far as David was concerned? He was defying God. 
The God of Israel, Yahweh, being great I am, has been defined by this giant standing across the river, and he has continually cursed the people of Israel who are God's people. The king of Israel who is God's anointed. And that makes David angry. He doesn't fight for himself, like his brother thinks. He's not there to see a battle because he likes blood. David is there because he's angry that this God would defy God. That's what it means to be a man after God's own heart. It's not about being violent. It's not about being selfish. It's not about wanting attention. It's about wanting what's best for God and God's people. Who here is fighting any giants in their lives? Yeah. Yeah, the giant isn't really the thing. As scary as the life is, the life defies God. And there are things in our lives which defy God in our world. Um, this week, I had one of those struggles. I'm not very good at sharing with people. I'm kind of a quiet sort. I don't like to express what's going on in my life. But this weekend, um, my girlfriend, who I've been dating for two and a half years and who I've known since 2007, she and I broke up. Ooh. And for me, I kind of saw it coming, but at the same time, I know that I will struggle with that from here for a long time. Uh, I had wanted that to go all the way. That was something that I was really striving for. I was trying to reorient my life just to get that relationship to work out, and now it isn't. And for me, that's almost insurmountable. I don't, I don't know what to do to make that work out in my life. I don't know where to go from here exactly, because all of my plans were to move closer to her and to get this thing figured out. And I was even finishing up school, trying to sort out how our future would look. And now I have to decide how I'm going to deal with that giant in my life. Because it's, it's about God, too. Because my life is in service to God. If I want to be a good Christian, if I want to be the kind of person I should be, I have to think about God first. But that giant stands in front of me and tells me that I'm not good enough, that I can't win, that I'm little, that I'm not capable. And my guess is you're struggling with that too. If you're human, which you all seem to be. God is with David. God never left him, filled him. Ever since he was anointed, he was filled with God's spirit. In fact, here's what it says. I want to read this to kind of finish this up. When David is anointed in 16, Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. God is with us. Amen. Amen. We know that we've been baptized and the Holy Spirit has come down upon us just like it did with Jesus. If you remember Jesus being baptized and the dove coming down, the Holy Spirit. You have that in you. God has not left you nor abandoned you. And no giant, no matter how large, tall, scary, loud, angry, worrisome, can hold you back. There's one giant you can't conquer. Just one. Can anybody guess what the one giant is that you cannot conquer on your own? The devil. The devil? What else? When we come here and we take communion, what do we think about? We think about Jesus, right? What giant did Jesus conquer? Sin. Sin? You cannot conquer sin. You will make mistakes. You will do things wrong. You will cause your life problems from bad decisions you make. But the Holy Spirit resides within you, and sin is already conquered, my friends. Jesus has already won. Thank you. So if you need prayer for the giants in your life, I know that our elders are always available. I'm available. And if you'll pray for me about the future for me as I struggle with my own, 
the school and worrying about relationships. I would appreciate it. But let us leave from this place knowing that there is no giant that we cannot conquer. And there is no giant in our life that has not already been conquered by Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Let's stand for